Okay, so yesterday was a day, and today is another day, and things are happening at breakneck speed. So as I mentioned, after the sort of summer lull, which lasted approximately 37 seconds, every piece of news in the world hit at exactly the same time. Literally within minutes, we got verdicts coming in on the Paul Manafort indictment. Paul Manafort was found guilty on eight separate charges. There's a hung jury on the other 10. And we had the Michael Cohen indictment that came down. He pled guilty to a variety of crimes, including, most importantly, crimes regarding campaign finance. Let's start with the Cohen stuff, because it's easy to talk about the Manafort stuff. The Manafort stuff basically has nothing to do with the president. There's some ramifications for the president theoretically, but those are theoretical. Michael Cohen stuff is a lot more damaging to President Trump. Here is the direct section from the actual Michael Cohen indictment. It says, the United States attorney further charges the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 as amended, Title 52 U.S. Code Section 30101, regulates the influence of money on politics. At all times relevant to the information, the Election Act set forth the following limitations, prohibitions, and reporting requirements which were applicable to Michael Cohen, the defendant, Individual 1, and his campaign. Individual 1, in this case, would be President Trump, who was, of course, the guy who hired Michael Cohen as his fixer and had him as his personal lawyer for years because he only hires the best people. Here's what the indictment says. Individual contributions to any presidential candidate, including expenditures coordinated with a candidate or his political committee, were limited to $2,700 per election. And presidential candidates and their committees were prohibited from accepting contributions from individuals in excess of this limit. So I am not allowed to give $3,000 to Donald Trump, and he is not allowed to accept $3,000 from me. Corporations were prohibited from making contributions directly to presidential candidates. So if I start an LLC and I give money directly to President Trump from that LLC, that's a problem, including expenditures coordinated with candidates or their committees, and candidates were prohibited from accepting corporate contributions. On or about June 16th, 2015, Individual One began his presidential campaign. That would be Trump. While Michael Cohen, the defendant, continued to work at the company and did not have a formal title with the campaign, he had a campaign email address and at various times advised the campaign, including on matters of interest to the press, and made televised and media appearances on behalf of the campaign. At all times relevant to this information, Corporation One was a media company that owns, among other things, a popular tabloid magazine, Magazine One. This magazine would be, presumably, the National Enquirer. In or about August 2015, the chairman and chief executive of Corporation One, this would be chair... Chairman One, this would be David Pecker, who's the head of National Enquirer, in coordination with Michael Cohen, the defendant, and one or more members of the campaign, offered to help deal with negative stories about individual one's relationship with women by, among other things, assisting the campaign in identifying such stories so they could be purchased and their publication avoided. Chairman One, that's Pecker, agreed to keep Cohen apprised of any such negative stories. Consistent with the agreement detail described above, National Enquirer advised Michael Cohen, the defendant, of negative stories during the course of the campaign, and Cohen, with the assistance of the National Enquirer, was able to arrange for the purchase of two stories so as to suppress them and prevent them from influencing the election. First, in or about June 2016, a model and actress began attempting to sell her story of her alleged extramarital affair with individual one, that's Trump, that had taken place in 2006 and 2007, knowing the story would be of considerable value because of the election. She then retained an attorney, this is Stormy Daniels, who in turn contacted the editor-in-chief of the magazine and offered to sell Stormy Daniels' story to the magazine. At that point, David Pecker and, uh, the, and the editor informed Michael Cohen, the defendant, of the story. At Cohen's urging and subject to Cohen's promise that the National Enquirer would be reimbursed, the editor of the National Enquirer ultimately began negotiating for the purchase of the story. On or about August 5th, 2016, the National Enquirer entered into an agreement with Stormy Daniels to acquire her limited life rights to the story of her relationship with any then married man, which would mean Trump, in exchange for 150 grand and a commitment to feature her on two magazine covers and publish over 100 magazine articles authored by her. Despite the cover and article features to the agreement, its principal purpose, as understood by those involved, including Michael Cohen, the defendant, was to suppress Stormy Daniels' story so as to prevent it from influencing the election. Between in or about late August 2016 and September 2016, Michael Cohen agreed with the National Enquirer to assign the rights to the non-disclosure portion of that corporation agreement with Stormy Daniels to Cohen for $125,000. Cohen then incorporated a shell entity called Resolution Consultants LLC for use in the transaction. Both David Pecker and Cohen ultimately signed the agreement and a consultant for the National Enquirer using his own shell entity provided Cohen with an invoice for the payment of $125,000. However, in or about October 2016, after the assignment agreement was signed, but before Cohen had paid the $125,000, the National Enquirer contacted Cohen and told him, in substance, the deal was off and Cohen should tear up the assignment agreement. Cohen did not tear up the agreement, which was later found during a judicially authorized search of his office. Second, so I guess, I'm sorry, that was with regard to Karen McDougall, not Stormy Daniels. Then we've got the, the Stormy Daniels story. 
Second, on or about October 8th, 2016, an agent for an adult film actress, that'd be Stormy Daniels, informed Editor One that, that she was willing to make public statements and confirm on the record her alleged past affair with Trump. The chairman and editor-in-chief of the National Enquirer then contacted Cohen and put him in touch with the attorney for Stormy Daniels. Over the course of the next few days, Cohen negotiated a $130,000 agreement with that attorney to himself purchase Stormy Daniels' silence and received a signed confidential settlement agreement and a separate side letter from that attorney. Michael Cohen did not immediately execute the agreement, nor did he pay Stormy Daniels. On the evening of October 25th, 2016, with no deal with Stormy Daniels finalized, the attorney told the National Enquirer that Stormy Daniels was close to completing a deal with another outlet to make the story public. The National Enquirer texted Cohen that, quote, we have to coordinate something on the matter that the attorney is calling about, or it could look awfully bad for everyone. The National Enquirer then called Cohen through an encrypted telephone application. Cohen agreed to make the payment and then called the attorney to finalize the deal. The next day, Michael Cohen, the defendant, emailed an incorporating service to obtain the corporate formation and documents for another shell corporation, Essential Consultants LLC, which Cohen had incorporated a few days prior. Later that afternoon, Cohen drew down $130,000 from a fraudulently obtained home equity loan which he had obtained because he lied basically about his income. The next morning, Cohen went to the bank and wired approximately $130,000 from essential consultants to that attorney on the bank form to complete the wire. Cohen falsely indicated the purpose of the wire was a retainer. On or about November 1, 2016, Cohen received from the attorney copies of the final signed confidential agreement and side letter agreement. Michael Cohen, the defendant, caused and made the payments described herein in order to influence the 2016 presidential election. This is the key part. And so all of this basically only matters if this was an attempt to influence the election, in which case it is considered a campaign expenditure. Now, this part of the indictment is the controversial part because there are folks who say, a former chair of the FEC has said this, as we discussed a little bit yesterday, a former chair of the FEC has stated that this is not actually a campaign contribution because it's more of a personal contribution. Like, not everything that has an impact on a campaign is considered a campaign expenditure. So if I go and I spend $400 on a haircut, that's not necessarily a campaign expenditure. And if I use campaign funding on it, that may actually be campaign fraud. So if I pay off somebody, is that a campaign expenditure or is it not a campaign expenditure? It's kind of unclear. I think that's the fairest way to put it. It's a little unclear. There are folks, Mark Levin has made this argument, who say that that is not a campaign expenditure. There are folks like Andy McCarthy who say it is a campaign expenditure over at National Review. In any case, the indictment continues. They say, in doing so, in trying to influence the 2016 election by paying off these women, Cohen coordinated with one or more members of the campaign, so not just Trump, maybe more, including through meetings and phone calls about the fact, nature, and timing of the payments. As a result of the payments solicited and made by Michael Cohen, the defendant, neither woman one or or woman two, that'd be Karen McDougal or Stormy Daniels, spoke to the press prior to the election in or about January 2017. Michael Cohen, in seeking reimbursement for election-related expenses, presented executives of the Trump company with a copy of a bank statement from the Essential Consultants bank account, which reflected the $130,000 payment Cohen had made to the bank account of Stormy Daniels in advance of the election, plus a $35 wire fee, adding in handwriting an additional $50,000 for basically services. That's Cohen's kind of transaction fee. Cohen added these amounts to a sum of 180 grand. After receiving this document, executives of the Trump company grossed up for tax purposes Cohen's requested reimbursement of 180 grand to 360 grand, then added in a bonus of 60 grand, so Cohen would be paid $420,000 in total. Executives of the company also determined the $420,000 would be paid to Cohen in monthly amounts of 35 grand over the course of 12 months, and Cohen should send invoices for the payments. So he sent an executive of the Trump company those monthly invoices. It started listing off 35 grand for, for two months. Throughout 2017, according to the indictment, Michael Cohen sent to one or more representatives of the company monthly invoices, which stated, pursuant to the retainer agreement, kindly remit payment for services rendered for the relevant month of 2017 and sought 35,000 bucks per month. The company accounted for these payments as legal expenses. In truth and in fact, there was no such retainer agreement and the monthly invoices Cohen submitted were not in connection with any legal services he had provided in 2017. During 2017, pursuant to the invoices described above, Michael Cohen, the defendant, received monthly 35 grand reimbursement checks totaling $420,000. So that is the charge against Michael Cohen. The part of it that matters for Cohen is that he said that he did so in coordination and at the direction of the president of the United States, then just a candidate. Andy McCarthy suggests that basically the crime here is not necessarily paying people off. The problem here is how it was done. So Andy McCarthy sums up at National Review. He says Donald Trump could lawfully have made contributions and expenditures in excess of $2,700 per election if he just paid Stormy Daniels directly. No problem. Because of that, and because unlike Cohen, Trump is a non-lawyer who may not have fully appreciated the campaign finance implications, it would be tough to prove the president had criminal intent. 
Nevertheless, that may not get the president off the hook, says Andy McCarthy. As noted above, it is illegal for a candidate to accept excessive contributions. It is also illegal to fail to report contributions and expenditures. So what it looks like is that Donald Trump basically used Michael Cohen as a go-between in order to avoid campaign finance reporting. And then the question is going to be intent. Cohen has testified that Trump had full intent to violate campaign finance law.